I think often what I love about it, and even when I look at your design, like it makes loving ourselves easier because it kind of sheds light on all these aspects of ourselves. And we're like, we've always made ourselves wrong for these things, but they're actually like our gifts. I think that human design is like an experiment. And what I mean by that is I'm not here to just like tell you stuff and you're like, got it. You have to play with it and be like, what happens if I do this? What happens if I listen to my gut? And it's like a muscle that you build. And so I think that I've had enough examples in my life of what happens when I wait for the invitation, when I give myself time to get clear. I always just have to sit back and I'm like, I know that's the right thing to do. And so I think that faith is built through practice and through just beginning to trust it and sort of seeing where it leads you. And I think the minute I try to control things and architect things and kind of make things happen rather than allowing it to happen, is it's just no fun and things are far less successful. That's Aaron Claire Jones, and this is episode 316 of Wellness Force Radio. Wellness Force Radio, where we discover the physical and emotional intelligence to live life well. You can have the same brain states as someone who's done an hour of meditation every day for 40 years. There's a lot of losses that we go through, so the ability to be able to cope with those losses is very important to build skill in it, because loss will happen. You know, you have to have spiritual courage to really grow spiritually, because If you really want to take guidance from your soul, you have to be ready to realize that many of the things that you're asking for guidance on, your ego has some kind of an addiction to or an investment in. Welcome back to Wellness Force. It's Josh Trent. I hope you're having a warm and supportive day out there. It's that time of year where it gets really cold outside. This episode is going to warm you up, I promise. We're talking with Aaron Claire Jones about this incredibly fascinating wing of human evolution and psychology named human design. Have you heard of this, human design? We're going deep in this podcast. Stay tuned. Your heart and mind are going to be warmed. This episode is brought to you by our friends at Life Aid Beverage Company, who just in time for the holidays, when everybody's stressed out, they've made the best tasting CBD recovery drink I've ever had. I know this. I drank this. And honestly, it felt like it was made from angel tears. It was tasty. It was so good. The rosemary, the lemon balm, the agave, the hemp, the extract from cannabinoids. THC-free, by the way, no THC, no psychoactiveness. If you're working in the airline industry, I had somebody write into Wellness Force and they're like, we, didn't, we can't do any CBD because even if there's a trace amount of THC, we get booted. So until the FDA gets on board with us, just trust this drink is THC-free. By the way, you will absorb CBD sublingually or by drinking it. This patented microcellular nano-encapsulation process that LifeAid has in this CBD recovery drink, you'll actually absorb what you drink. It's fancy science terms for whatever you drink, your body will actually take in. For the holidays, LifeAid gave us 15 bucks off your case when you pre-order. All you have to do is text the code FORCE to 474747. That's FORCE to 474747. You get $15 off your case of Life Aid CBD made from angel tears. (laughs) No, it's really good though, I promise. It it actually is really good. You can also go to the show notes page at wellnessforce.com forward slash 316 to learn more about Life Aid CBD. Now, whether you're in a committed relationship right now or you're single or you're just dating, this podcast is for you because I've been hearing about human design for over five years. It's up there with the discussions around gene keys, emotional intelligence, conscious communications. Human design is at the crest. This show is a deep dive discovery of what human design actually is how it can apply to your navigating your relationships. Do you ever wonder why you like the toothpaste a certain way? Your partner likes to put the blanket on the couch a certain way. You have a certain way of communicating. You have a certain way of expressing. All these things can be seamlessly blended together in mutual understanding if you just understand your human design. This was fascinating to me. I found out that I was a manifesting generator, and you'll learn what that is as well as the other types in human design. This human design, it's it's a synthesis of ancient wisdom, the astrology, the I Ching, the chakras, the Kabbalah. Blended with modern science, quantum physics, and genetics. In other words, this is a really smart way of understanding why you do what you do. We're learning from Erin Claire Jones. She's a leadership coach. She specializes in human design. She's been flying across the country over the past couple of years teaching this work to corporations and to truth seekers like you and me. I got to do this podcast with Erin in Malibu in LA in person. I got to say, she is such a genuine and sweet soul. A woman really just doing her work on such a big level. It was a true honor to talk and record this podcast with Erin Claire Jones. We're going to drop in right now so we can understand this system that sheds light on our emotional, psychological, and really our energetic makeup. Why we do what we do, because what I really got from this podcast, and I know you're going to get this too, is your own unique self-awareness some tools that'll align you with your truest nature, 
so that the end result is you stepping into your highest potential so you can kick ass at all the different areas of your life. If you enjoy this podcast, share it with somebody. Share it with somebody you care about. I'd really appreciate it if you could do myself and the entire Wellness Force team a huge favor. It's actually not that big of a favor. It's like 90 seconds, but it means a huge amount to me. Can you leave us a five-star review on iTunes? It helps us reach more intelligent souls like us. Leave me in the review who else you want to see on the show. Or you can give me feedback. Hey, Josh, I like your voice. Hey, Josh, your voice reminds me of somebody from kindergarten. Whatever you want to say, just go to iTunes, leave us a five-star review. You can also go to wellnessforce.com forward slash review. Thank you, my friend. This means a lot. And by the way, when you sign up for this review, when you leave us one, you get entered to win a month's supply of Organifi for free. So if you're feeling it, go to wellnessforce.com forward slash review, or you can just go to iTunes and leave us a five-star review. Now let's talk live with Aaron Claire Jones. To really, to really do a good job here, to really live our life well, it's this constant undulation. It's, it's, wild. it's this constant balancing act. Totally. And one of the coolest things that I've ever come across is human design. People probably don't know exactly what human design is. We're going to go deep today, Erin. Um, I'm sitting with Erin Claire Jones. She is a leadership coach. She specializes in human design. And if people haven't heard of human design, they're probably thinking it has something to do with how we're designed as mm-hmm. a human. Which is true. <laughs> Shocker. <laughs> um, but um, before we even talk about your story and how you got in there, which is fascinating, I already did a reading with you, which sparked like just loads of curiosity in my heart and mind. You found it when you were in corporate America, didn't you? I did. How did it come to you? Like it was through a friend or how it was did it actually through a stranger. I had been working, I was working at a bunch of startups at the time and I was, I live in New York City and I was sitting at a party on the Lower East Side and a guy sat next to me and started telling me about my design. He looked it up on his phone and just started, and like, I'm so open to this stuff. I'm like, tell me everything. Yeah. Um, but he just started telling me these things about myself that felt so familiar and like felt so intuitive, but it also was a, many things that I'd never actually given myself permission to step into. And it was so like, even though it came from the stars, because human design is based on your exact time, date and place of birth, that information itself was so grounded and practical and like tactical that I was like, I am in. Yeah. He also was like, we're meant to work together. And we did. So, so you got wisdom <laughs> at a bar. <laughs> a backyard, but yes. Backyard. Party, for uh, sure. Uh, do you connect the dots now? Like we're going to talk about how you travel, you help thousands of people. Do you ever look back now at this point in time on the woman that received that download and go, huh, I can see why that came for me then? Totally. What was that? I mean, yeah, the timing is always just blows my mind because it feels like it was just like the stranger that we found each other that specific time. But like I had come from a place of working at startups and being like, this is an amazing mission. I'm working with amazing people, but people like don't understand each other. They don't know how to work together. And there was just like so much dysfunction. And I think simultaneous to that, I was like, you know, doing my Reiki trainings and my yoga teacher trainings and my Kundalini teacher trainings. And it just felt like these two separate worlds. And I feel like I didn't know how to bridge them. And so when human design was introduced, I was like, oh my God, this is the bridge. Like it bridges all the worlds and it gives me a language to communicate with the the corporate world and kind of solve the issues that I was seeing. It's way different than astrology. Like, Yes. It, it takes pieces of it. Of course. Um, you, you said on your site, astrology, the I Ching, the chakras, the Kabbalah with modern science, quantum physics, and genetics. I yeah. mean, that's a lot. It's like, a lot. You can take any one of those things and design an entire life study <laughs> <laughs> like, on like one of those 100%. subjects. 100%. Uh, how, how do you think this came to be, this, this amalgam of all these different modalities? Because like I said, each one is a life study. How do they all totally. dovetail? Yeah, I mean, it's pretty crazy. I think that how human design came about was there was this guy, I think I told you this, this guy Ra Uhuru who who was in Ibiza. He used to live in Canada. He was like an advertising executive there. And he had a very mystical experience where he basically channeled the system for eight days and eight nights and then spent the next 20 years building it out. And the information, I know, he's no longer alive, but there are institutions around the world sharing it and teaching it. But he basically said this is like the first 21st century system because it combines everything. And when you look, actually look at like a human design chart, you can see like the zodiac, you can see the like tree of life in it. You can see all these different components, the I Ching that kind of yeah. play into it. So I think that it's just, and all those systems systems are so valuable on their own. But I think there's like something about just like when they all come together, we actually get our own operating manual in a way that like is just so empowering. I love that operating manual as if life was that simple. I, know, right? <laughs> right? I looked at my chart, which we'll go over and there's all these lines and colors and gaps and um, 
I actually did not know that there was five types. For some reason, I thought that the rule of thirds applied to, to, this, <laughs> to this piece. Yeah. Because I find that in nature, I'm curious how you feel about this. In nature, there's this rule of thirds, you know, whether it's the Fibonacci sequence or beginning, middle, and end, or inside, middle, outside, or inhale, hold, exhale. It just seems to me like the rule of thirds is always present in all phases of nature. But why do you think there's five types of human design like what why why the number five you think oh my god i honestly have no idea i like to ask hard questions i know it's a great question i just i would be making something up if i had a reason but i think in human design there are actually like two billion different configurations so i think i actually don't put that much importance on the five because i'm like that's just the first piece okay it keeps getting like more and more specific like i've worked with so many people and like no one has the same design so th- my chart was radical for me because um, when we had our session, I was thinking, God, so much of this is true, mm-hmm. you know, and, and a lot of times people will look at astrology and they'll take some things and leave the rest. And Bruce Lee talked about this. And when I went to Vipassana, Goenka said this on our, on our exit. He was like, you know, everything you've gotten today in these 10 days of silence, take what you want and leave the rest. Do you feel like that mindset still applies to human design? Yeah, I, I mean, I honestly say the same thing in, yeah. um, in all my talks because also a lot of my clients are corporate clients and it can be a little bit intense to like just have a system based on your birth information. But I think, honestly, in my experience, my design has been incredibly accurate every single piece of it. But I think in general, it's like, again, take the things that resonate, leave the rest. It's probably going to integrate in different ways over time. But like human design is not a belief system. My intention is never to convince someone of anything. It's like, I want to introduce this framework and then like you feel into how it actually feels for you and where it can be helpful. Yeah. And it works in the 3D world. It's not just for four and 5D like post-ceremony conversations. At all. Uh, It's growing. And the reason I think why you're so pronounced is because people are looking for guidance. We're all figuring out what the heck we're doing here in a body on a rock in the middle of outer space. Mm -hmm. a soul inside of a meat suit. (laughs) Exactly. And and there's no real easy way to live life. We go through it and we figure out what works by trying and falling and loving and hurting and forgiving and all these different things about human emotion. Mm -hmm. So I'm, I'm fascinated with this and there's so many different ways we could start this Mm -hmm. conversation. Maybe the greatest place would be um, how you actually found this in the bar. And then what was your steps uh, in the backyard? What was your steps after the backyard? Because I'm sure a part of you was like, wait, is this really true? Yeah. Is this really something scientific that I could help other people with? Yes, totally. Um, I mean, I had such a strange reaction to it because I think that it was like first introduced and I was like, this is interesting. This really resonates. Okay. And then probably the person that introduced it to me, my first teacher, it was in New York and he lived in LA and I ended up going to LA two months later just for life. And I reached out and we sat down and he started showing me all the ways that human design could be applied to business. So not only in the path of like individual transformation, but how you can actually engineer teams based on human design. And like, for some reason, like I actually just didn't need, and you can see it in my design, like I didn't really need to understand all the details. Like it just made so much sense on an intuitive level that I was like, I'm in. And I basically committed to building a company around human design with my former teacher and business partner immediately. So it hit your physical intelligence first. Totally. Because sometimes the body feels things that that the mind's disconnected from. Exactly. Actually a lot, Which especially like in our world. 100%. And so much of human design is basically about getting ourselves out of our heads and into our bodies because our minds are so powerful, but not often reliable in terms yeah. of making decisions. You're like so speaking our language. You know what I mean? Yeah. And so yeah. I think that there was just this certainty within me that I was like, and I think like prior to that, I'd been like, I really want to be like on the cutting edge of something. I just like know there's something like new and I want to share, but I don't know what it is. And human design just made sense to me. Mm-hmm. But then, you know, then also it was early for it. I think that like I was in Bali at the time I came back to New York he moved there we started building the company purely focused on corporates and I think that like it was just people weren't quite ready for it you know I think that like human design was like not in the mainstream at all it was like such a foreign language to people so it was like pushing through to try to make it happen it's interesting this push versus pull and I I've read Hawkins book power versus force and then uh, most recently letting go and he talks about the space between the head and the heart this is the big space, even though for yes. most people, it's about, well, I don't know, 12 inches, I don't yeah. know, 18 inches, depending on how tall you are, if you're a basketball player. And, <laughs> and yet for so many of us, the masculine specifically, um, I'll speak for myself, like that's been my biggest learning curve is connecting heart and head mm-hmm. because I, I wasn't modeled that. And a lot of us that are seeking guidance from human design or any kind of operating frame, totally. we're just looking to operate from the head and heart being connected. Mm -hmm. How has human design helped you connect those two for you? 
I think that like there's a language in human design that I love. It's called inner authority versus outer authority. I might have mentioned this when we talked, but basically the idea is that like our heart and our kind of innate knowing is our inner authority. That's what we're designed to use to make decisions for ourselves. Our minds are not that. Mm. Our minds are what we call outer authority. That's what we're here to like provide inspiration to others. And so I think that I've just learned that like the things that I know that are right for me are not the things that I can explain. It's just like a knowing that like someone or something feels right. Like human design, I was like, this is it. I literally have no idea where it's going to take me. And it was a super bumpy road. Like, you know, thank God I am where I am now. But like, it's been a journey. So I just think that it's dropped me into my body and my knowing in a way that like I never could have anticipated. Okay. So when you say it dropped you into your body Mm -hmm. for somebody that doesn't do yoga or or hasn't meditated yet, maybe they're just tuning in for like the first time and they're like, what does she mean dropping to the body? Because I know what you mean. But but, but what is the, the actual embodiment of being in our body? What is that? So I think that like, you know, and it shows up so differently in different people's human design. So for some people, it's going to be like, they're just like really connected, like for you, really connected to your just like gut response. So whether or not you're like doing yoga or practicing, often you have just like a feeling about someone. You walk into a room and you're like, oh, that person feels exciting. Like, mm, this doesn't totally feel right. Yeah. So it's kind of learning to like drop into those just innate knowings that we have and trusting them. So often we know and so rarely do we trust. You know, I feel like so often I work with clients, they're like, I'm going to leave this job. I'm going to leave this relationship. And I'm like, and when did you know it wasn't right for you? And they're like, the minute I said yes to it. So I just think that we so often know and our body is just, it just knows things that we can't conceive with our minds. So it's often just these like feelings, these whispers, these kind of gut feelings that we have. I want to challenge you on that because so many people talk about intuition. Yes. And for some of us that have either had specific degrees of trauma, or if you look at Bessel van der Kolk's work, The Body Keeps the Score, there's this line in our society between fear and self-sabotage yes. because my gut told me so. Little do we know if they have gut dysbiosis, which could be affecting their their gut brain Mm -hmm. axis. And then on the other side of it, it's like, oh, the intuition speaks the Mm -hmm. truth. So how do we decipher Mm -hmm. between self-sabotage, fear, and possible dysbiosis in our gut? Mm -hmm. Or if it's actually us, if it's actually our intuition guiding us? Mm -hmm. So... It's a great question. I definitely talk about this a lot with my clients. And one, I'll say in human design, like not everyone has a gut response. Some people, it's like intuition. Some people, it's like verbally processing. So it's like all over the place in terms of what's correct for people. But I think when it's like, feel, like often when it's like a yes, there's like this like real expansion and excitement and just like openness, you know? Yeah. And I think that like when it's fear or sabotage, they often don't feel that thing. Do you know what I mean? And I often feel like also when there's like fear or sabotage, there's a story they're, they're telling themselves of like, I can't do this because this, or like this feels scary in this way. But like, again, when it's like a full body gut, yes, it's not a thing that you can rationalize. You're like, this thing just feels right. It just feels good in my body and I want it. Yeah. You know? And so like, so what I do, I think it feel, it requires tuning into it and also just like starting to listen. I feel like my experience with clients is most often when they start practicing, they can kind of start to hear the difference. How do they practice? What does that look like? So for you, for example, your yeah. authority is emotional, but you basically are designed of a very strong gut response. And I'm a manifesting generator. Yes. We'll talk, we'll touch on the types we'll in a touch moment. On that. Yeah. So it's really helpful to ask you very specific questions to kind of bypass your mind and get you straight into your gut. So instead yeah. of asking you a question like, where do you want to go for dinner? Would be like, do you like, would you like to cook at home or go out? Would you prefer a salad or a soup? You know, just things that you're like, yeah, no, yeah, no. You know, my partner has this too. And like, he just blanks when I ask him an open-ended question, but yeah. like I ask him those specific questions and he knows in the moment. That's so funny. I always find I'm asking my partner, Carrie Michelle, like, what do you mean when you said blank? Like, I'll want to know a, like a layer deeper. Totally. And she's like, what do you mean? I just told you. Yeah. <laughs> and I'm like, well, tell me the deeper part of it. Totally. Is that what that is? Yes. And also sometimes like, I'm not having a response to what you're saying. Like, ask me another way. Oh, you yeah. You know, like something that kind of triggers that response yeah. in you. And I think also like, this is just specific to the gut response. So the generators and manifesting generators, which I'll know we'll, t- we'll touch on. But again, it's like when you walk into a room or into a restaurant and you just like start to feel like, what am I feeling like expansion towards? Like, who do I feel actually drawn towards versus like, where am I feeling like contraction away from and starting to kind of tune into those innate responses that you're having to people and things. You know what I've sensed is sometimes I'll be so drawn to something, but at the same time, I'll feel this little bit of fear of or a little bit of like, ooh, like a, ooh, is there a butterfly in my <laughs> yeah, chest yeah, right yeah. now? Uh, is that intuition, you think? I think that like, I mean... I think if you're drawn to something, that's kind of the answer. Okay. My sense is that like... Even if you're afraid. Oh my God. The fear... Like, and the thing is, in human design, you can literally see fears that you have, but like, it's just like the fear is never going to disappear. The like, key is just not to let that like drive you. (laughs) 
I found that to be true. You know? <laughs> for sure. For, but so like for yeah. me, I have like a huge fear of failure in my design. So whenever I'm making a decision and I'm like avoiding it because I'm scared of failing, I'm like, oh, no, no, no. Like that's not cool. You know, I know that that's a fear in my design, but I'm not going to let that be my driver. So manifesting generator, um, 33% of the population mm-hmm. for the manifesting generators. Mm-hmm. Um, my partner is a generator, generator. Mm-hmm. 37%. Manifestor, 9%. Projector, 20%. And then there's this like anomaly re- reflector, like one less than 1% of men and women. Mm-hmm. Why do you think there's such a focus, such a gap of generators and manifesting generators? Like why? Oh, between the two of them? Yeah. Like, well, not just between the two of them, but it looks, seems to me like the lump sum of our population is generator, manifesting generator, projector. Yes. What, why are those three here now? So I think that why we have, so manifesting generators and gen- generators make up collectively like 70%. And yeah. I think that we need them because they're the ones that like are here to build and create and do and make things. And so like we wouldn't have like homes and companies and things okay. if these people weren't there. So like, I think that's why they make up the majority. I think projectors, like we need them too, because they, I'm a projector. It's like these people are really here to kind of be like leaders and guides and advisors and ask people questions, give people things to respond to. And so like they work in partnership with generators so well. And so they just offer or like a very different perspective to just like business and life. You know, these often people are often like coaches or therapists or healers yeah. kind of working one-on-one with people. I think manifestors, we don't need as many of them because they're so impactful in their energy. And these are the ones that are really here to just like initiate and get things started. And if we had everyone doing that, we probably wouldn't have that much getting done. You know, yeah. like they're here to like get the ball rolling and then like they need support to actually sustain and bring that thing to life. Okay. Let, let's go just like a, like a foot into each one of these. Yeah. So, um, Let's go mine first. So manifesting generators, like what are their qualities and characteristics so somebody listening can get kind of identified, not with who they actually are yeah. as a label, because that's one thing I want to be really cautious of. Like yeah. just because we're going to be going over tendencies and ways of being, it doesn't mean that it's a sentence. It's, not like, it's not like branded on your life. Totally. But there are things that light up inside of people when they hear like, oh, well, these qualities mean that I probably have a tendency to be a blank projector mm-hmm. or reflector or whatever. Mm-hmm. But, um, exactly. So what are, what are the manifesting generators known for? So yeah. I'm, and one other piece I'll add there too, is that like, just when you, when you know your design, it doesn't mean you have to operate like it. You can operate however you like. It just yeah. often means that like life might feel a little bit easier and in flow if you do. Mm. And so, but again, take the things that resonate, leave the rest. So manifesting generators. So these people are powerhouses. These people really have the energy and the life force to kind of build and create and bring things to life. And the most important thing in the world is that you're designed to do work that is deeply satisfying to you. So you're kind of designed to wake up each morning with like a full tank of energy to use your energy in super satisfying ways and then kind of crash and wake up recharge. The magic of manifesting generators is that they can actually bring things to life very quickly and efficiently. They can like see the where things are going and find the most efficient way to get there, but also like skip some steps along the way, which is sometimes why they need the right support to do it. Okay. And they're also designed to have their energy in a lot of things at once. Like it's not about just doing one thing, but just like honoring all the things they have their energy for and basically pivoting away from something as soon as the energy is no longer there for it. How do they know when the energy is no longer there for them? Is it just that intuitive faculty it's we're talking about? the intuitive faculty. And we also know. they're just like I, don't, I'm like, I don't have energy to do that thing anymore. I'm doing this thing because I think I should, but I'm like dragging my feet. Yeah. You know, yeah. and so like often I work with manifesting generators that have like a traditionally amazing job, but they're like, I'm so bored. Like I need so much more stimulation than that. And it's not about like actually finishing all the things they're doing, but about having that stimulation and excitement of being like, I mean, these are the people that are like, I'm a mom, I'm a yoga teacher, I'm a dance studio. Like it's just all the things. And that is their magic. I remember being in corporate America 2015 before I got the gift of being fired, which led me to be sitting here with you in Malibu overlooking an ocean. How lucky. <laughs> so reverse engineer that folks. Um, but I remembered feeling the way you described where I was like I'm not opposed to working hard so I don't think manifesting generators have any kind of issue with taking action or being bold or or Mm -hmm. working but it has to be poured into a vessel with with meaning 100% because if not yeah. then the fuel source is finite. It'll just run out, right? Exactly. And like the more lit up you are by how you're spending your energy, like the more energy you have and the more magnetic you become. Yeah. And I have so many clients that are like, yeah, I've been successful and for 20 years doing a career that I, I'm like good at. But like imagine what happens if you start to funnel that energy into like something that you love, you know, it just becomes a different thing. We can even be, I'll speak for myself as a manifest and generator, we can be good at stuff, mm-hmm. get awards or excel, but still like way deep down, I think in our core, we know if our souls align with it or not. It's like a soul attachment here. And um, the next one is uh, generators. 
generators, 37% of the population. This is actually my partners. Yeah. So later on, let, we're going to dig into relationships. So like, stay tuned. Yeah. <laughs> we're going to talk about how these things relate to relationships. But um, for generators, they're, they're known for something totally different yes. than a manifesting generator. So, and they have a lot of similarities, which is also this amazing vitality, energy, life force that kind of bring things to life. But like their gift is not in doing all the things at once. Like they're here to kind of do this step by step and like really master a process and bringing something to life. And like often they're like doing one thing and then like when it's time to pivot, they'll do the next thing. Um, but again, like so important that they're actually doing work that is personally meaningful to them, you know, because again, when they're lit up by what they're doing, they're basically powering their like energy and the room of like everyone around them, you know, but when they're like not, then like people are going to feel that too. So making sure that they're deeply satisfied in how they're using their energy. Would you say that, that these types of the generators, you can really feel their heart on their sleeve. You can really feel their emotions. Like they're not able to hide their emotions. I think that um, with generators in general, I think that like they're definitely more open, both manifesting generators and generators like have this very like open, attractive presence. So like yeah. there's some types that are much more closed and that's not true for you. Okay. It's very just like, or for your generator partner and generators in general, like they're just kind of open and enveloping and just kind of bringing you to them. That's so fascinating to me because I'm thinking about the way that she operates and it's like, yes, I'm, I'm she definitely like does not hide her emotions. If she's yeah. happy, she's happy. If she's sad, she's sad. Of course. If she's moody, she's moody. And like we all go through this of phase course. of life, right? We're all yeah. allowed to feel all of our yeah. emotions all the time. Um, what about the the projectors? <laughs> So yeah, projectors are so interesting because I think because we live in a world that is mostly generators and manifesting generators, we're basically all trying to keep up with that energy. Yeah. And projectors, our energy is a lot more inconsistent. We're not designed to work super long hours every day. It's basically about working in spurts. Like the joke for projectors is they're meant to work like three hours a day, which I know is not feasible wow. for some so of they, us. So they align with Tim Ferriss, like the four hour work week. Yeah, I know. They, I got to look up his design. They like um, that. But I think that it really is because their gift isn't kind of like in the guiding and the asking, but not actually and then in the managing but not really not really in the doing yeah. and they are really gifted at kind of understanding people being very sensitive to energy they can kind of really lock into people and make them feel very seen and recognized so in the context of companies they often make really good managers um and just by themselves like really good coaches consultants like healers you know people that are working directly one-on-one -on -one with people when i hear the word manifester i i heard about it probably 2009 from the secret you know, uh, remember yeah, the yeah, secret yeah, yeah, yeah. with the little kid in the bike and his grandpa gave him the bike and he like sat in the tent and he's like I want the bike and then his grandpa delivered the bike I don't know if it's always that easy yeah. I think there is a science to manifesting yeah um, there's 9% of the population that are manifestors are they literally just calling it in is that what they're doing so the idea because we all can manifest obviously but I think that like what I didn't mention about projectors is they're the design to kind of be invited in and recognized. So rather than like initiating things, waiting to be invited in before they engage. Manifestors are the, are the only type that are here to initiate and make things happen. Mm. They're the ones that are here to make the first move. And so like they're here to get the ball rolling, not actually here to do all the doing, but like just get it started. And so they do have the capacity once they have an urge to just like bring that thing to life in the moment. Um, I think the key thing for them is like they need like autonomy and control and freedom. They're not very good at working for people because I think they just like need to kind of be do things on their own terms and in their own way. And so in like corporate settings, they often work best when it's like, this is your domain, do what you please, let us know how it goes, you know, or they often end up working for themselves. Yeah. Cause I can think about the way that the, even the word manifestation is thrown around and it's kind of abused. I think 100%. Gosh, that, this is why I wanted to have you on the show Yeah, because you've been in the corporate world. Yeah. You transitioned into really having like a foot in spirituality and mm -hmm. understanding how to move people that are more spiritual, you know, yes. Alan Watts calls them prickles and goo. You yeah. know, you're, you're either like the, you're either the analytical person that's logical or yes. you're like the more flowy spiritual person yes. that wants to connect, that wants to connect heart to heart. So for, for people that are more logical minded mm -hmm. and, and they're more analytical, um, does this reflector piece even, it's what, less than 1% of the population. Is that who they are? Or is it more the, the goo? Is it more the, the touchy-feely people for the reflector? I think that like, so the reflector, it's it's so hard to know. Like the analytical people can be all them. I think that's going to speak to a different element of their design. Okay. I think that's going to speak to like their mind and their head and how that is um, configured in their design. The reflectors, but I love the skeptics. They're my favorite people to work with ever because human design is so grounded that they often are like, what in the world are you telling me? Why does this resonate so much? Um, but I think for reflectors in general, these are super unique people that kind of serve as mirrors. They are so sensitive to their physical environment. So they basically take in everything in their environment and mirror it back, basically kind of reflecting back the state of things and showing us like how things are progressing. These people are like very malleable where over the course of a month, they're going to have periods where they feel like a generator, like a manifesting generator, like a projector, like a manifester. So like it's never about getting fixed into one way of doing things or one like sense of identity. It's very fluid for them. Okay. 
Give us an example of maybe like a public figure or an archetype or yeah. just somebody that we might all know of who might be a reflector. Because these are like anomalies. These yeah. are rare people. I know. So um, do you know Ama? She's like the hugging saint. She goes around and hugs millions and millions of people. Okay. Um, which is so funny. I've, I've gotten a hug, received a hug from her before, but it really is like she just reflects back where people are, you know, and it's very mm. powerful. Um, there's a lot of talk around Michael Jackson, whether or not he's a projector or reflector. And then also Sandra Bullock is a reflector too. And I think it's a great one for an actor and actress in general because they are so malleable that they can kind of adopt any identity and way of expressing themselves. It almost feels like they're a shapeshifter of some sort. 100%. And so it's so powerful for them to find this system. And I've actually worked with a lot of reflectors at this point because like they're often just like my experience of life is so different than everyone else. And like you're just giving me a language to really understand it. Wow. Okay. So let's talk about the language component because we've had so many guests on the show that have talked about like internal language, external language, way of relating, empowering language, disempowering language. There's a lot of language models. How does language apply to human design? Are there certain ways of language that each type uses or does language even play a part in human design at all? I think that language does play a part. I think um, what I would say is that what is magical about human design is it basically gives us a language to understand like all this energetic stuff that's underneath the surface. So often when I'm telling people like what their design is, it's not stuff they don't know, but they've never had a language to actually express it. And so I think what it does is it just gives people like a framework and a structure to make sense of how they operate and to communicate about it. And you can imagine how helpful that is in teams and partnerships when you're like, I know exactly what's happening. Like in my former business partnership, like we would have friction or a conversation. We'd be like, oh, I see what's being triggered. You know, we'd be able to like have something we could reference back to and know and see what's happening. Do people come to you primarily for self-understanding and relationship dynamics or is it more the professional setting? I'm sure it's a bit of everything. It's kind of which, all of it, yeah. Which one's... But let's be real with us. No, what, yeah. Who comes to you more? I think that like... Um, okay, outside of the like company clients yeah. on the individual level, I think that like... It's, it's honestly, I don't know which is more. It's always questions of like, what should I do with my life? But it always comes back to like, I want to find my partner. I want to be with somebody like it. I mean, we were talking about it a little bit before, but yeah, like we relationship were. is kind of like what my partner does too. It's like, he talks about love and sex because that's what it always comes back down to. Yeah. And what people end up being really curious about. We want to have great sex. We want to feel connected with other people yet. We can't do that unless we know who we are. Exactly. You know, if you look at any model of human behavior, or any author that's ever written about human dynamics, it always starts with know thyself, mm -hmm. which is really at the crux of what human design is. Yes. I feel like this is that amalgam that we talked about where it's the Kabbalah and the chakras mm -hmm. and the astrology and quantum physics and genetics. There's so many things that we're drinking from a fire hose, Aaron, mm -hmm. you know, and, and why, why will people trust this above other things? I think that, in my experience, it's just like, I think I'm just like, I'm going to introduce this to you. If it resonates, like use it. I think that like what, why I think people end up trusting it is it tends to like resonate on a very cellular level like it did with me. And it's just like, oh, this just makes sense. Like, but I also think that it is very practical. Like I think we we're talking about this strategy before of like allowing things to come to you, which is true for you. Yeah. Is that I think people, it gives people like such tactical ways of operating that like just makes sense to them. And I think that like, I don't know if we always need more information. I feel like we need strategies to integrate it in. And I think human design is like so specific around like, trust your gut, allow things to come to you, you know, wait for an invitation, sleep on things that it's just like it, I think that it makes sense to people and it just allows them to continue down a path they kind of knew was right for them, but they weren't actually allowing. So I'm going to be selfish here because be it's wellness force. I can do that because mm -hmm. your podcast. <laughs> this is the podcast where I just share where I'm at truthfully. Sometimes it's not that comfortable because I'll talk about what's really going on for me, you know, and it, and it brings up pain to talk about, but I know it's of service to other people. And then sometimes it's really fun because I just get to be creative and curious and connect with another human being. When it comes to relationships, manifesting generators need certain things in order to feel, um, energized mm -hmm. in order to feel present and, and connected. What, what are those things mm -hmm. that, that someone like myself might need when we look at human design in a yeah. relationship? In a relationship. So I think that like, and this is true for both manifesting generators and generators. Like I think that they can get really tripped up if they like fall into someone else's flow and they're not really honoring the things that feel good to them. Like these people are most of service to the world when they're honestly just like following the things that bring them joy and bring them pleasure. So I think that for both you and your partner, it's like, you know what, maybe our flow isn't the same today, but you go do the thing that lights you up and I'm going to do mine and we'll like 
reunion at the end of the day. That seems true. You know? Um, and I think also what I find with both of these types is that because they have all this like vitality and life force and energy, people often kind of want it. They want like a piece of it and not in like a malicious way, but they're like, can you do this and this and this? And so for both of you to have like incredibly clear boundaries around like I'm available for this and not for this, you know, and not saying yes to all the things because that's just going to deplete you like no other. Yeah. You Would know? you think using a calendar with a schedule, like, hey, we're going to block out free time for this space to mm-hmm. play mm-hmm. or to do. Mm-hmm. And then the rest of the time is yours yeah. and mine. Yeah. Like creating healthy boundaries using technology or... Yeah, I think, I mean, technology for sure. But I think just like, I mean, I was just in Bali with my partner and it was so funny. We were like traveling together for two months. And at one point we're like, we don't have to spend every second together. And we're like, see you tonight, you know? And we just like allowed ourselves to have the days separate. And so I think it's just like, when you're feeling that draw to go do your own thing, just allow it. You know, mm-hmm. you can structure it into a calendar, but you might not need it all the time. And also to express it too, to, to say, I love you. And you know what I'm really feeling today is this thing that's lighting me up. Totally. I'll see you at six o'clock or whatever right. it is. And they're probably going to be in the best place then. And yeah. then, and then there's this clear, beautiful line of, this is who I am, and this is how I feel. It's so easy that way. But I've I've sensed, and I don't know if this is because I'm this type. People listening, maybe you can relate to this. When your partner doesn't express what they need, and it's just an open kind of Lucy, no real, I need this, yeah. or I, I, hey, I'm feeling this way, but I don't know what I need, but I at least want to tell you I'm feeling this way. That's when I get the most triggered. Totally. That's, that's when I feel like my energy starts to leak. Mm-hmm. What is that? I mean, I just think that like, it's just not us honoring ourselves and what we need and who we are, you know? And I think that we end up just saying yes to all the wrong things. And then we just like get off track. You know, I think it's by like tuning into, and I think human design helps us do this, tuning into what we actually need and communicating it. It just like allows us to be ourselves in relationship, huh. you know? And I think that like, I might've mentioned this to you on our call before, but like the recommendation in human design, it's especially for certain types, but I believe it's true for everyone is that it's really healthy to sleep in your own bedroom and to not sleep together every night with a partner. Did I tell you this? Wow. No. Yeah. Interesting. And it's like, and it's especially true for manifestors and projectors and reflectors. But the idea is that we impact each other so much energetically when we sleep that it's just a little bit easier to wake up as ourselves when we wake up in our own energy. What's the frequency of sleeping in the same bed versus not? It's up to a, you know, a couple. Like I always say, so my partner and I have our own bedrooms, you know, and so we probably sleep together like, you know, two, three, four nights a week. But we also, when we travel, we sleep together the whole time. Yeah. And so, but I think for, it's just like having, not having the default be together and basically allowing yourself to be in your own space and then choosing when to come together. Wow. I have to be honest with you. That is so fascinating to me because I'm, I'm always like, oh, I, I, of course we sleep in the same bed together. Well, that's the assumption. Yeah. I just think. What's behind that? The separation? what is behind it in human design. It's just that like, you know, if you look at your human design chart, you'll see all these centers that are colored in or white and the areas that are white are the areas where you're kind of taking in other people's energy. And so the idea is that when you're sleeping next to somebody, you're just impacting each other, taking in each other's energy when you sleep, taking in their emotions, taking in their identity. And so when you wake up, you're kind of like in this, just like a lot of energy that it's not all of it's yours. And so sometimes it's a little bit harder to be ourselves when we wake up or we might be more exhausted or we might be more emotional or whatever it is. And so the idea is that sleep is an incredibly powerful time to just let go of all the energy that's not yours. And when you do it in your own physical space, it just like can be awesome. Wow. And I think there's a lot of conditioning there because I just, so much. part of me is like, well, of course we're going to sleep in the same bed. Why would we not? I mean, I love bringing it up because it's a little bit triggering for people. Yeah. They're just like, it doesn't, I'm even, yeah. I'm even wondering like, it's not a triggering for me. It's just more like, why, well, why would I want to do that? Mm-hmm. I'm not angry at it. I'm just mm-hmm. thinking like, huh. Mm -hmm. I I would just prefer to like, you know, snuggle for a little bit and then go to bed. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Just something to play with. You know, I think that like, and your type is not the one that it's like super recommended for, but it's just like, I, and I'm never going to tell people to do that if they're not drawn to it. But I think there are a lot of ideas that like our relationship, like can't hold it or our relationship. Like it means that our relationship isn't doing well, you know, but I think also just sitting back, if the options are that choosing and not having the assumption be like, we're going to sleep in the same bed, have the same bedroom. This is really cool. It's going back to what I think is really an undercurrent of human design. And that is honoring the body's intelligence. So if the body's saying something like, like, hey, tell your partner that for Saturday, on Saturday, you just want to like sleep in a separate room and mm-hmm. color, whatever you're going to do, you know, meditate, yeah, whatever yeah. it is. But maybe the reason that doesn't come up is, is out of fear. Exactly. Of being rejected. Yeah. Or maybe like something's wrong with the relationship. If 
Exactly. And not just like trusting it. And I also think that like where the challenges tend to show up is like when we expect someone to be different than what they are, we expect someone to be more similar to us, you know? And I think the magic of human design is it's like, y'all are super different. You know what I mean? And like just, (laughs) and like one very simple example is like I, when my partner and I travel somewhere, we'll land in a new city and he's like ready. He has all the energy in the world to go explore the city. I need to like lay on my back for four hours. And like, I think that now we like understand it. It's just like, I'm like, I want to go out. He's like, no, 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 you can't do that. But we know that like I'm a projector. I need a lot more rest. Traveling like really takes it out of me and he has the energy to go explore. And I just feel like it's been so much more harmonious to kind of understand that and have a language for it. What's what's some of the ways that your work, how many years has it been total for you in human design? I started in 2015. Okay, so almost five years. Now. Yeah. It's gonna be 2020, by the way. That's if, crazy. If y'all are listening to this in 2020, welcome to a new decade I know. of life. Oh my God. The mystery continues. Um, so I'm I'm <laughs> curious for you within this yeah. five year period, Looking at your type, your partner's type, did you use human design to to change the way that you interrelated together? 100%. What are some ways that happened? So, you know, and again, it's just given us a language. I think we probably would have figured it out on our own, often with human design. Like when people are like awake and connected to themselves, they're going to do it organically. Yeah. But I think that for us, like for example, he makes decisions very quickly because he has a very strong gut response. He knows in the moment if something's correct for him. I need a lot more time. I need to sleep on things and like really feel into things. And so now we have this language where he's like, let's do this. And I'm like, yeah, you know, I don't totally know. And so just allowing that rather than making myself wrong for not being quicker in that way. Um, I think also like he responds, like I said, very well to like very specific questions. Whereas like I respond well to like more open-ended questions that just like allow me to like verbally process. He like invites me in and facilitates opportunities for me because he knows like my strategy is all around the invitation. Um, and again, just knowing the differences in our energy, like he's got this amazing energy to like build and create and do. And like mine just is different. He's also my business partner. So like we're working together in all the ways. That's an interesting match. I mean, that's rare that people can live, work, be in love together yeah. and do a mission together. Yeah. What, What's the recipe on that for you two? I mean, we're definitely figuring it out as we go. I mean, I honestly, I worked for him in Are 20- you trying to say you're not perfect? Yeah. Is that- <laughs> And definitely not. Okay. Um, I mean, our I worked for him in 2013. That was like our first relationship. It was a working relationship. Was um, he? Was he your? He was uh, my boss. Supervisor. Okay. Yeah. He yeah. was. I was consulting for a company that he had. Okay. That's how we met. Um, and I think that. It feels really good. I mean, we just have, like, I think when you have chemistry with someone, it's like, it's like you can do all the things with them. And I don't, and I think especially for us as a projector generator, we're just so different. So I think working with him is amazing because we kind of, and he's not doing this full time at all. Like he's got his own stuff, but he's offering more of the like strategic business stuff. Um, But I think that just having very clear boundaries. Like for me, I'm like, let's talk about business all the time. And I think having those boundaries around like, we're not available for business talk at these hours and in this Mm. way. And just like, I think the priority is our relationship and our connection. And so just like being able to prioritize that. So holding the relationship in a sacred space, 100%. where literally if we were in tribes and there was no technology and we were just in the jungle, there'd be certain ways of relating where we would be honoring one another in a very sacred way. Yes. This the way that you and him operate through this lens of human design, how would you think that the sacredness is preserved? You know, how does human design preserve that relational sacredness and maybe even just sacredness of being a human? I think that it like preserves our individuality and like preserves just like our uniqueness. I think that like for us, there's no pressure to like collapse or merge into one thing. It's just like, oh my God, you are this and that's so special and you are this and it's so different. And so I think that human design just like has helped us kind of like, just like solidify and understand our differences so that we can honor them wow. and not try to change each other. What are some of the ways that, that myself as a manifesting generator can honor uh, my partner's type? You know, because because she is a generator. So how does a manifesting generator honor and keep sacred the parts of her? Yeah. So I think that again, it's definitely like making sure that she's doing the things she enjoys and yeah. like. And I also like you take your design to take a little bit more time when you make decisions for those big decisions. I really am. You really are. It takes me a minute. It takes you a sec, and you're gonna have a yeah. gut response, but like it might change, you know. Yeah. And so just being like, oh, I'm still excited about this thing. I stew on later. shit. <laughs> me I'm too. Like, yeah. I, sometimes I need a week. 
Yes, 100%. To, to really decide on something. You know, reflectors need a month. Did I ever tell you that? Oh, shit. <laughs> it's so different. You yeah. know, again, we're all so different, but they often, whenever I talk to them, they're like, yeah, I need that full cycle. Okay. But I think for her, she actually can make decisions more spontaneously. And like, as soon as she gets that gut response. So like allowing her to kind of make decisions in the moment, whereas like you give yourself more time to stew. I would also say that like you really broadcast out your emotions and maybe not even in a conscious way, but like when you're on an emotional high, you're going to lift us all up. And when you're on a low, she and people are going to feel it, especially her because she's actually incredibly empathic and very open emotionally. So I would just be aware of that, you know? So like maybe if you're in a lower emotional state to kind of be in your own space, let it be more reclusive. Um, You know, this happens with my partner and I all the time. And like, he's more open emotionally like her. And he's like, I see where you're going. I'll see you tomorrow. (laughs) He's like, be in your thing. I'm just not going to take it on as my own. So just kind of having that awareness. Okay. So the way that these pairings interrelate. So let's just say that there's the generator, there's the manifesting generator. Are there certain types that are more drawn to each other because they just fit more securely like puzzle pieces? Like, yeah. are, there, are there similarities that you see with these types? You know, there are and there aren't. I think that like, because I think what I generally see is like there's often, often like with generators and generators or generators and manifesting generators, there's a resonance. So it makes sense that those people are drawn to each other, but we're often attracted to different. So I do see yeah. a lot of generators and projectors. Like I did two sessions yesterday with a manifester and a projector. I would never have said that was like a more typical one, but I've seen a lot of them in LA. And so I think any dynamic is possible as long as you understand the differences. Mm-hmm. I think if you're of like for, a lot of my former partners are projectors. So I think that like when you're with a similar type, then there's just like a level of resonance there. Um, but I think when you're with a different, it's just like, okay, you're different. Let me like not try to impose my way on you. Yes. I can, I can even think about partners in the past where I wonder now what their type was I know, it's so fun looking because back. I, I would pull in like not the same person cause nobody's the same, but I would, I would attract certain types of people that really allowed me to not look at my own shit. Yep. Like there was a way that I could be with them where the deepest parts of my shadow as mm-hmm. young talks about. <laughs> uh, we we really we never went there mm-hmm. you know and then it was only when i turned 34 33 years old that i had a partner that came in and just split me wide open and since then i've been open to really seeing all the parts of my shadow like i'm in the camp of like just bring it on you know yeah. I, it might hurt it might feel uncomfortable but at the same time mm-hmm. like it's gonna be there whether i want to look at it or not totally so uh, what element of personal development and, and partner relating Mm -hmm. does this dynamic bring on for people? Like, Mm -hmm. is there a pairing that's just not for each other? I think that like, I I don't think I could ever say that because I don't think that's fair. You know, I think that there are some relationships where I'm like, this doesn't look easy. And like, it's probably going to require more work than others. But I like stand strong that I think anything's possible. But I do think that like, yeah, there are some that are far more difficult. What what would they be? You know, I just think that like, For example, I was actually just doing a podcast with a reflector and a manifesting generator. They have a great relationship, but they're super different types. You know, a manifesting generator has this all this energy and life force. And if the reflector just like takes that on and tries to keep up with it, it's going to be super challenging. So for her, it's like spending all the time alone and just like reconnect her own energy. So I think when it's like one person has maybe a lot of energy and a lot of kind of just definition and life force in their design and the other one has less. Yeah. How do people really work on their strengths? In other words, how do you honor like a design that you might have? So myself as a manifesting generator, like, is there one or three things that I could really just honor every day, like set the intention when I wake up, Mm -hmm. you know, like, Hey, this is my tendency type, or this is my human design. Like, I'm going to do these three things today to love and honor that part of myself. Yes. So the three things I would say is just one as a manifesting generator to be like, what are the things that are the most just like naturally energizing and exciting today? And how can I funnel as much energy as possible into those? Mm. And what are the things that are the most draining and how can I take as much out of that? Emails. Emails. Exactly. (laughs) Also like specific to your, to your design, it's all about following your feelings and only doing things when you're in the mood. So I think that when you're asking yourself, like, am I in the mood to socialize? Am I in the mood to like go dancing? Am I in the mood to do this? Like doing things when you're in the mood, when it's possible. I know that there are going to be some um, limitations around that with work. Yeah. Um, so that's a big one. And then also, you know, I mentioned this to you before, but you're somebody who's incredibly sensitive to your physical space. So as you go throughout the day, I would just make sure that you're in places that feel good to you and knowing that like life is going to flow so much easier when you're actually in the right physical space. Mm. What about for the generator? Like, do they have certain, is it the same for generator where they need a certain space? No, cause that's not even specific to your type. 
Mm. That's to a certain center that you have. And so that's called a, a G center, the identity center. So um, it goes a layer deep. I oh mean, my God. We've, we've gone into the types. Yeah. But you guys, I'll actually post this. I'm going to post this in the show notes today so you can take a look. By yeah. the way, this is not yours. This is mine. <laughs> so yours will look way different when you work with Aaron. Yeah. But, but there's type, strategy, self-theme, inner authority, profile. Um, there's a lot in there. There's so much. And, and my strategy is to respond, you know, right. which for me feels like, oh. I just finished a breath work training this week mm-hmm. and it just brought me down to my core. Talk about body intelligence. Mm-hmm. Like, man, it's, it's written on my arm in Italian. If I can breathe, I can choose, you know, say, posso respirare, posso scegliere. Can you breathe? Can you pause for a moment and take a breath? Cause wow. if you can, then you're going to be able to decide yeah. to respond, which is when I read that, I was like, Duh, like yeah. it, it really sunk in there. Wow. These, um, these strategies within the human design, Can we go over just a few of them just Mm -hmm. so people can get a little taste Mm -hmm. of that? Yeah. So the strategy for manifesting generators and generators is to allow life to come to them. So basically they're designed to be magnets. It's not about chasing after things and trying to make things happen or force things into existence. It's basically about being like, I'm actually going to attract it all to me. And my work is to just know what I'm available for and what I'm not. That's obviously very different than the way that a lot of people have been operating. Projectors is all about waiting to be invited in and recognized, which is another layer of waiting. And I think when I first found this out, I was like, this feels really boring. Like, I don't want to sit on the couch and wait. And I think that like my work has been like, how can I make myself visible and available to be invited in and recognized? So creating some action behind it. For manifestors, their strategy is all about initiating. So making the first move, but also about informing. So once they've made a decision, reflecting on all that all the people that decision is going to impact and making sure they let them know. Hmm. And then the strategy for reflectors is also about kind of waiting to be initiated into things. But when they're making a decision to give themselves a full 30 days before they make it for the big decisions. Yeah. The, the strategy, I love how it's called strategy. I know. Has this been updated since the founder, he passed, right? He passed. When did he pass? I don't actually remember the exact year. I think it was around 10 years ago. Has anything changed since he passed? Like who's taken this over? So there are some like institutions around the school on the, around the world offering it. Um, there are new applications. I think people are kind of like interpreting some of his older material around like my focus has always been business, but around health and all the things. Yeah. I think that like less has been changed, but more people are translating it in different ways. I think that like as we've talked about it, there are some ways of talking about human design that are kind of just like a little bit antiquated that are like not very accessible and pretty full of jargon. And so, you know, and so <laughs> I think you. that there, yeah, I yeah. hope I don't offend any of the human design people out there, but I probably right. will. But I think that like my intention with human design, and I think a lot of people now is to make it like super simple, super accessible, super practical. So like, I think that we're actually talking about it and using a very different language, but a lot of the core pieces are there. You know, it's fascinating to me is um, my strategy and my partner's strategy is to respond. Yep. By the way, for you guys that don't know, if you heard me breathing in, we're using Dr. Nick's essential oil <laughs> wizardry. I'm using the Invigor. How amazing is this? So good. This is not an ad. We're just being real. Like we're actually using this in the middle of the podcast. If you have not checked out Dr. Nick's essential oils, <laughs> go there and you can use the code wellness for us. You get a hookup. It's 15% off. And by the way, get the hookup because these things will shift you. They're amazing. I can just feel my lungs expand. I know. It feels so good. So I, I was going back to what we were saying. My partner's a generator. Her yeah. strategy is to respond. So is mine. Mm-hmm. Do people tend to attract with the similar strategy or, or is that not really present? So the strategy is connected to the type. And so every generator and manifesting generator will have that strategy. Mm. And so I think that, yeah, I think that there's resonance where it's like you're attracted to people that like have a similar vibe. Yeah. But I think also you're often attracted to people that are very different. Yeah. yeah, we have to be very careful too, because sometimes um, the old partners I was talking about, they were, I was attracted to them because I knew I didn't have to face my shit. Yes. Not with this one. Exactly. Not like a healthy... <laughs> the, this this pairing is totally different. And, yeah. and as we go down the line, there's, there's the, the self-theme, there's the inner authority, but then there's this profiling. And we're not going to have time to go super in depth on the chart. We're going to talk about a blueprint that you can give to everyone, yeah. which is fucking awesome. Yeah. And I have to say that because not everybody is going to be able to take the time to work with you, of course. but you give them something where they can actually dig into this and start making real life changes. Yes. So hell yes on that. Mm-hmm. But, but when we go to the profiling, mine is a three, five and Carrie Michelle's is a three, five. Which so, is so cool. So what is that? What is the profile numbers? So the profile is going to look like some weird fraction number. There are 12 of them in human design and they're basically how we're designed to kind of manifest our purpose. And so, and just like how we're designed to navigate through life. And so it's so cool that you both have them because again, there's just like a resonance there, just an understanding of one another. And it probably is very helpful. So the three piece means that you're really here to learn through trial and error. You're here to learn through discovery, making mistakes, bumping into things, figuring things out as you go. Yeah. 
never making yourself wrong for not getting it right the first time or also making a mistake because you're here to just like glean as much wisdom as possible and just bring it on to the next one. And so kind of supporting each other in that discovery process and also like sharing with your audience all the things that you're learning. Yeah. Makes sense. Uh, that makes sense. And it feels true because that's the whole part of the show when it transformed and when we really started to grow our movement is when I finally just said, hey, guys, this is the truth. I'm not an expert. This is what I'm really learning. This is where I've bumped my head and gotten bloody. And, and exactly. this is like the things that I'm struggling with. Exactly. You know? and, and that's what draws people in is just having the understanding that we're all here figuring this thing out together. Totally. And so maybe it's no surprise then why so many people are this manifesting generator. You know, the generator, the manifesting generator, like mm-hmm. you said, is 75% of the population. Mm-hmm. Um, that, that profiling, though, the, the three and the five, there's some math in here. Math was never my strong suit <laughs> in school. So, so when you get your blueprint from Aaron, like, like there's a way that people get walked through this math, right? Yeah. To understand Yeah. It. And also, cause again, some of this language doesn't really make sense. Um, but I think the three, five is like, they're just different aspects within you. Like the five piece is also around the fact that you're like a very natural, like leader and fixer and problem solver here to offer like super practical solutions for people. But also like, you're here to kind of like come in and save the day and then like go, you're not here to like just stay in the heat of it, like solving all day long. And also I mentioned this to you before, but w- something to watch out for is that people may project things on do you like project that you can fix them or guide them or lead them or save them and so it's super healthy for you to be in just like in integrity with who you are and like only say yes to the right projections and not to all of them (sighs) that sounds like a lifelong journey of course it always is you know (laughs) but again just having that in mind you're like "Mm, doesn't totally feel right well, when we look at like being a guider, a, a steward of someone else's life, you know, I look at my brother and how wonderful he is as a father. He's such a good father. Mm. And, I, and I can even look at many parents out there that are doing an amazing job. And there's a learning curve with being a parent. I mean, think about what's really happening with parenting. You're being a steward of another life. Is, is human design and parenting, is that, is that something where they can get real tangible actions to change their parenting styles? I was actually like just thinking about that. I was hoping you would ask. I think that like human design and parenting is so powerful. Like the founder of human design would always say that like human design is actually for the kids. Like it's so (laughs) useful for everyone. It's going to like help us come into alignment. But like often there's so much deconditioning and letting go of all the things that we're not. And when you're actually parenting according to your kids' designs, you're giving them permission to be who they are from day one. And like, and, and you're going to parent them differently. You know, just like a small example, like one for you parenting when you're young, it's like letting you be like such an experimenter and trying all the things and like just be like what did you learn from that you know never rather than making yourself wrong but like you know for as generators and manifesting generators like they're not designed to have a set bedtime like if you're like this is your bedtime go to bed like you have to use up all your energy before you go to sleep and so your work is to kind of use it up in super exciting ways and then crash you know yeah and whereas like projectors like we need time to like unwind and have a bath and like as a projector it's like noticing that like they're not going to have as much energy and like really inviting them into things recognizing them manifestors giving them control and freedom and autonomy to kind of do things in their own way you know and really training them to kind of communicate and keep people up to date so that they don't experience that resistance in the future what about when we get stuck in a loop or or what do you do personally how do you relate to human design when you're kind of in the shit (laughs) you know when you're like i'm i'm experiencing something of contrast right now and i don't want to feel this yeah where do you go how do you use human design for that i think that like human design so it can show you all the areas where you can like be in the shadow of something and so so often when i'm like in the loop is like because I'm really in the shadow of some aspect of my design and so like one area for me is like working way too much and being like super overzealous and just like getting very irritable because I'm just like not honoring my energy flow so one I it's very helpful because I have a partner that like calls me out the minute it happens but I also just like I start to notice I'm like why am I pushing like my energy like flow is really about to like stop right now rest go to sleep and like wait for the energy to kind of reemerge. or like sometimes when I'm just like irritable because I'm making decisions too quickly and I'm not really tuning into my emotional wave Um, I can go to this place too, where it seems like a lot of my life was this sine wave of, of burnout and then crash and then recharge and burnout and crash and then recharge. And, and, and you guys all know, you can visualize this like a sine wave on a a heart rate meter where it goes up really high and down really high. I found like my life, um, up until recently was just this constant wave of burnout and then recharge and Mm. back and forth and back and forth. There's something about my way of being, my way of relating to this manifesting generator that can allow me yes. to have these things come in. Is it as simple as having faith and trusting? 
I think a lot of the times, yes. I think there are some more tactical things, but I just think that like when we start to just like really trust and just like trust that things are going to come to you and that like it's not about you pushing after it, like so much emerges from there. But I'll also say with your design specifically, like you're not designed also to work super long hours every day. Like you're designed to like, like really kill it for three or four hours and then take time to rest. Like you can accomplish so much more in a compressed period of time than most people. Mm. So I think it really is like when we start to honor like our unique flow, life becomes a bit easier. How do you build faith no matter what type you are? Yeah. How do you build faith personally, you know, when the evidence of what's out there versus the evidence of what you know to be true is different, you know, right? Where do you go for faith? I think that, I mean, I was just writing about this. I, I like human design is like an experiment. And yeah. what I mean by that is like, I'm not here to just like tell you stuff and you're like, got it. It's like, you have to play with it and be like, what happens if I do this? What happens if I listen to my gut? And it's like a muscle that you build. And so I think that like, I've had enough examples in my life of what happens when I wait for the invitation, when I give myself time to get clear that like, I always just have to sit back and I'm like, I know that's the right thing to do, you know? And so I think that like faith is built through practice and through just like beginning to trust it and sort of seeing where it leads you. And I think the minute I try to like control things and architect things and kind of make things happen rather than allowing it to happen is like, it's just no fun. And things like are far less successful. I, on our initial call, you asked me something like, how would you describe yourself or, or who, yeah. who are you today? And I was like, I don't know. It's so different than yesterday. Like, and this is where you even talked about this in your Forbes article. You were like, it's really what this does. It gives you the self-awareness and tools to align with your nature mm -hmm. and step into your highest potential in every area of your life. Mm -hmm. But when I look at the self, my self-awareness constantly grows, constantly right. shifts. And the parts of myself that I was aware of in the past, yeah. they don't even resonate with me anymore. Yeah. So don't you feel like really on, on top of a context with human design, there's also just this surrendering aspect to 100%. Oh, I love who I am at now. Yeah. You know, I love yeah. Josh Trent. I love Aaron Claire Jones. I yeah. love whoever, whatever your name is, like, yeah. can you, can you look in the mirror and just like actually love yourself, not faking it, but yeah. for real, like embody self-love. Mm -hmm. How do you feel like human design allows people, or maybe there's parts of it that allow people to drop in to that. their self-love? Yeah. And there's a tagline for so many like human design people that they're like, just like, love yourself. That's the whole point. It ain't a light switch though. We can't just flick that no, shit. No, no, no. I think the often what I, what I love about it, and even when I look at your design, like an area where you are really open and flexible is your identity. Like you're not meant to feel the same every day. You're like, this is who I am today. And this is who I am today. And it's always changing and adapting. And so I think so often it, it makes loving ourselves easier because it kind of like sheds light on all these aspects of ourselves. And we're like, we've always made ourselves wrong for these things, but they're actually like our gifts. They're the things that we're like here to do and we're really good at. Like manifesting generators are often made to feel scattered or that they're doing too much, but they need to have their energy and all those things. So I think that like loving and trusting becomes so much easier because it's just like, oh my God, this is just who I am. I feel the permission to like be in it and step into it rather than try to be all the other things. Do your parents uh, love and support your work with human design? Uh, yes. Yeah. But they always have. I've always been like a total weirdo in what I do. I think human design is like the first thing that they can kind of explain what I'm doing to people. Most often they're like, we don't quite know. <laughs> um, but yeah. They, yeah, they've been, I mean, they trust me. They're just yeah. like, you seem to have a direction, even though we don't understand it. So I know that human design technically is for everyone, but who is it really for? Is it for the people that maybe parts of their body lit up on this podcast mm -hmm. or like it's that body intuition. We've done a lot of shows about physical intelligence mm -hmm. and, um, the body, like you've said, you know, the, the body knows so many things that the mind really can't even conceive to be true. Exactly. But it's in there. Exactly. You know, the flutter that we feel when we meet someone new, um, having excitement to have a real conversation, yeah. you know, going to a, a dance, ecstatic dance, or, and then also having the intuition to know when something's not yours, you know, like, do I really want to go to the football stadium today? Mm -hmm. You know, do I want to go to a bar and eat chicken wings? And, and if you do, cool. If it feels good, great. Yeah. But I just, I feel like there's really some other layer of intuition here that we're tapping into. There's some way that this human design is tapping into the infinite. Yes. You know, there's and a like connection to higher power through this thing. Absolutely. What is that? You know, I don't know exactly, but I think it's like, it's exactly the surrender piece is I think that there's like all of a sudden human design encourages us to like take our hands off the wheel and just like surrender and just like trust that when we align with our strategy and authority, like everything will happen as it's supposed to. And so I think that like, there's just like, and that's been so empowering for me. So I think that kind of just connects us to like our role in like the whole world of things. Yeah. And also the acceptance that we're not everything. <laughs> no, and we can be. That's the magic. It's like, I can do this and I need everyone else to do that. It's so fascinating though, because we come into the world as children and from zero to seven, our brain is malleable. Every single thing is about us. 
if you look at child psychology, like the reason that things hurt so much when we're children is because everything's about us Mm -hmm. all the time, Mm -hmm. 24 seven. Mm -hmm. So this is something that I could see being used in traditional therapy at some point to, to help people really look at their shadows, heal the wounds and move forward with life. So, and the whole purpose of this show too, Aaron, totally. is like we're just we're just discovering this physical and emotional intelligence so we can live our life well. That's the whole I enjoy point. It. And it kind of gives yeah. me like a cry feeling just to even think about it. It's like we're here to live well. That's exactly. the whole point. Exactly. How do you see the the human design coming into the psychology world in the future? It's so funny. I've had a number of sessions recently where people are like, my therapist referred me to you. And so I just really? think that like, and I've seen therapists who are like getting their blueprint. I want to understand human design because I think that like they're probably going to support their clients differently based on their design. I have a lot of coaches that do that. You know, they like get evidence designed before they coach them. So I just think that like we communicate and can support people differently as we can parent them based on their design. And so I think like therapy wise, it's like when you know they're a projector, you're like, oh, I see why you're having such a hard time with that piece, Hmm. you know, and knowing that your projector will probably make that a bit easier. So tell us about the blueprint now, because there is a way that we can learn there's a lot of things online where people can type in their birth date, but it's different than the blueprint. Yeah. What's the blueprint? So the yeah. blueprint is a 30 page PDF on your unique design. And it basically gives you clarity on all the things we talked about today and so much more. And I think the intention is to really just give you practical tools to integrate it into your life. Because I really am a big believer that like, we don't need more information. We need tools and we need like practices. So often with the blueprint, people just kind of use it as a resource manual that they can keep referring back to. Hey man, we don't need more information. Yeah. And uh, before you tell us to get the blueprint, the location of it, like I just want to say this one thing. I love having conversations like this because it really gets people past the mental shit. That's the whole point. And, and, and if you've been listening to us and if you've been with us, like feeling what we're talking about, go with the feeling. Yes. I want to invite you to go with the feeling of what you've been feeling. And if you're pulled towards getting a blueprint, taking a discovery path, figuring it out, just do it. It's exactly. all good. Like, like we're here to be curious children. We're here to learn and to discover mm-hmm. what intelligence really is. Mm-hmm. And, and one thing that I, I mentioned to you on our first session is like, intelligence ain't how smart you are. At all. It's not about how much y- you read or how many PDFs you download or all this stuff. People could go and get the blueprint. They could download it. But how do they embody it? Mm-hmm. You know, and, and that's, a, that's a real piece that I think does touch on the self-love and honestly, someone's curiosity just to explore who they really are. Mm-hmm. Exactly. Yeah. And, and right. And I think the embodiment is really just like integrating it into your life because human design at its core is about how we make decisions. So bring it into every decision you make. So the blueprint, where's the location? Aaron Claire with an E jones.com slash blueprint. And we mm-hmm. have a discount code wellness. Oh, you're giving us a hookup? Okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's on now. So you can get a discount off your blueprint. Great. So you can go, we'll link that in the show notes today. And um, what a beautiful exploration of higher intelligence, emotional intelligence, physical intelligence, the way that we feel, trusting that. Like this has been really, really good. And at the center of all these things too is is wellness. This Mm -hmm. is who we are, is, is we're sentient beings brought here from wherever we came from, mm-hmm. which we're all, we're all still trying to figure that out, of exactly course. where we came from. <laughs> it's somewhere out there. Um, but we're here to live well. And so this, this convergence of the physical, the emotional, the spiritual, how do you define wellness? You know, what, is, what is wellness to you? Wellness to me is just like feeling very good in my body and in my mind and in my spirit and feeling like aligned with what I'm here to do. And I think that it's just all the things, you know, I think that historically I've like taken really good care of myself, but haven't been on purpose. And so I think that like, it's just integrating all three of those things. Aaron Claire Jones, thank you for coming on the show. And, um, this has been incredible. I, I really have so many other questions. <laughs> we can probably do a Facebook live on this or something yeah, later so because fun. there's other questions that I have specifically about relationships. We're talking oh, about right. Aaron's work, wellnessforce.com forward slash group in our Facebook group. You can also go to the show notes page, wellnessforce.com forward slash radio. Aaron, thanks for coming on the show. Thanks for That's meeting me here in LA. Oh my God. So fun. So glad we got to do it. All right, you guys, we'll talk to you soon. And before we see you again, Live your life with with love and connect with people because that's the whole point of why we're here. So until I see you then, I'm wishing you love and wellness. 
Thanks for listening to the show, my friend. Everything you learned on this podcast starts, hey, morning practices. So from over 300 world-class guests, we pulled together six simple yet powerful morning practices down into a 21-minute system guaranteed to increase your vibration and the way that you feel every day. Get this free powerful guide over at wellnessforce.com forward slash M21. And if you love this show, share it with somebody. Share it with somebody that you love or that you care about. You can support the show easily by leaving us a five-star review on iTunes. Just go to wellnessforce.com forward slash review. Or if you're on your phone, just tap it, hit the link in purple that says review this podcast. And the journey does not stop here. We're continuing this discovering process in our private Facebook group over at wellnessforce.com forward slash group. You can be a part of it. You already are. All you have to do is join us at wellnessforce.com forward slash group. And I will welcome you at the door. Now go out into your life and live your life well. And until I see you again real soon, I'm wishing you love and wellness.